Hello and welcome back to Genesis Designs Modercraft Bench and welcome back to the Armour Hobby Hurricane build and in episode 2 we're going to paint and finish this now completely built model um, all I've done since you last saw it is mask it or complete the masking so the canopy uh, already was masked but I have taped it from the inside and then attached it to a spatula so that it's easy enough to hold that for painting and the other areas masked are obviously the cockpit aperture which has been masked off with tape and then underneath the wheelbase with a mixture of tape and blue tack we have a little um, the ident lamp that was painted with Tamiya clear orange and the supplied pre-cut mask was popped in there and I've obviously also masked off where the landing lamps are um, this green you can see on everything is uh, masking fluid so I have some Vallejo liquid mask no good reason for it being Vallejo except it was in a big jar um, all of them work in pretty much the same way but I like to use it in these sort of situations because it makes the masks a lot stronger so in both the cases of these wheelbase and this cockpit area uh, there's not much area for the tape to stick to and consequently the whole masking job is kind of fragile um, and in those situations not only do you, do you run the risk of and actually very often do get a lot of little gaps where things are a bit crinkly um, it is fragile so when when you then overcoat the whole thing with the masking fluid you see how it's attached along the, the, the edges there around the windscreen and it, it seals up all of those little potential gaps and it holds the whole thing together you can see the same here it runs all the way around the edge holds everything up holds all the tape together and fills up any little gaps that might be there um, so I will commence painting any time uh, the first steps will be to use interior green on the transparencies and then I'll paint all the metal areas silver and then I'll paint the whole thing black um, so you may recall from earlier from the review video that I want to do this one so I want to do BE581 uh, the Carol Cuttle washer aircraft um, but I don't want to do it in black I want to do it in the later shall we call it night intruder camo where they put the ocean grey and dark green back over the upper surfaces so these were painted in special night special night wore, wore and got dirty very quickly and easily and then when the night intruder camouflage was introduced that was simply painted over the existing night finish but obviously it would have been prepped properly uh, and everything else but consequently the finish that the finish that was ended up with was quite rough and ready in places uh, colours were patchy uh, and stripy and it also wore off the black very quickly as well because the black didn't make a great base coat either so I mean I could go for one of the other squadrons where I do have photographs of the actual the aircraft wearing that camouflage because that's the thing I've looked into this and there is no actual real evidence anywhere that I can find uh, showing this aircraft in that later scheme but there's also no evidence to suggest, suggest that it didn't wear it and by all, by all you know all else being equal the aircraft was in service long enough that it should have ended up in that scheme so that's where I'm going with it right then important point coming up so first first layers of paint have gone on we did interior green on the canopy parts both and then we sprayed the aluminium mix onto pretty much that whole model not all of it uh, but all of the metal areas and actually I did the seam areas as well just as a quick visual check um, now because of the amount and style of surface detail on this I did not prime any of the joints and by prime I mean my usual method would be to paint as the surface of 500 on with a brush and then smooth it off uh, because that does both jobs in one it gives you that visual check and then by rubbing it off you fill in any microscopic issues uh, I haven't done that with this I went straight in with aluminium and as we know the metallic metallic shades are the most unforgiving when it comes to picking up surface defects because of the way the metal reflects the shapes uh, anyway 
that was all done yesterday one a couple of coats or coat to coverage of this aluminium color and then the whole all of those surfaces had one coat of x22 thinned with mr color surfacer to a ratio of 75 25 so 75 percent thinner just one thin coat and that's just to harden the surface of that aluminium paint so then cut to this morning and i'm doing my usual toast and youtube combo downstairs uh, i looked at another build of this kit and I looked at some online uh, forum stuff and discovered that I had incorrectly digested the instructions here. So here it says to use part 66, A66, scheme number one, la la la, use part number A66 and flush with winged surface. What they mean by that is trim it down flush with the wing surface. I didn't realise that and I didn't do it. So I had the gun camera poking out and it shouldn't have been. So I've gone back in, I've trimmed it down. Do you see there? And I've erased any seams. Now in the act of trimming it down, um, the sort of hole detail in the front is matched up by by the back basically cut through the part so they ended up with a hole in it so that's been filled as well so that's been filled sanded scribed as necessary with the black super glue and whilst closely inspecting the model i thought i could see just the faintest shadow of a bit of a seam still on the top here it's more of um, a, a slight wave in the surface than anything else and as i say because it's metallic you can pick up on it really easy and my point here is never be afraid to tackle this stuff when you see it this is the time to do it the initial layers of paint right now I can I just use this fine blue pro modeler sponge and just really gently just tickled it and when you realize the microscopic thickness of this paint layer and most of it's still there you can see that we're not talking about a big defect but you take it out now and it's easy to paint back over it if you leave it let it annoy you until you get into the final stages of paint it's going to be a much longer and more problematic job to sort it out. The other thing I've modified also while I was in there, I found some information. Um, I was looking actually at a thread about the exhaust stub colour because this this aircraft didn't have the glare shields. It used a special paint on the stubs which makes them look different. And I was looking at that, looking at that, and I found a picture of the radiator bath and realised that this transverse seam because we have the two parts that join together isn't there on the real thing so I picked that part up and I've filled that transverse seam completely and this is one of those occasions where you have to make a choice we had raised rivet detail on this radiator housing that went along here right next to the seam I had to delete clearly it's going to be very difficult to reinstate that detail as it was offered initially and you have to make a choice basically of whether to live with the seam or live with losing some detail There's, there isn't any in between i don't have any uh, raised rivet decals or anything kicking about that's something i probably need to look into maybe getting some i don't have any currently so i made the choice to remove the raised rivets all the way back to here along this edge these obviously went as part of the sanding I've sanded it down and made it made it happy. The two the two parts the they didn't align sufficiently with this panel line, so I filled the panel line as well. And then I've rescribed that uh, both sides and I've reinstated rivet detail using my RB Productions riveting wheel. So these aren't raised rivets anymore. But I've put a line back in here, back across up the sides and along the front here so we've got some some stuff going on the real thing is made out of overlapping plates and if you really wanted to get good with it you could mask it and use some primer to build up that effect but i'm not too fussed so that's been rejigged re reworked this has been worked reworked i've just tickled this seam here and because of that i went along all of them again if we look at this one under the nose you can see if I hold it still, you can probably see what looks like a bit of maybe of a seam or a ghost seam. But remember, as I say, that's one thin coat of aluminium and I'm not broken through it. So really, there's not a seam there. I've not done a thing back here. It didn't need it. 
basically perfect and then on the top I just knocked back that aluminium just to be sure and, and I'm quite happy with that it's got good seams and a good finish everywhere so I'm now going to go back in with the silver and with the X22 yes we're incurring a delay because I've got to let that X22 harden up but if you want a good finish this is what you have to do hmm like a silver spot on my desk I wonder how that got there who knows right so I've resilvered him now you can see I'm sure you're sitting there going well you seem showing it's not really you can see an appearance difference because I don't have full proper coverage over where those differences in colour were it doesn't matter because I don't need this bit to be silver particularly so obviously the reason I've started with the silver is for chipping purposes um, the special night finish that these things were painted with was renowned for being fragile. It fell off uh, for fun and it got very dirty and nasty very quickly. So um, I want to start by painting the model black and, um, and doing a bit of chipping. Yes, I will then be covering most of it with camouflage paint, but then some of that will get chipped as well. So this is this is where I'm heading with it. So I have repainted all the areas that I was messing with. You can see where that gun camera was is now smooth. And everything's been resilvered and re-exed 22 and it's all beautiful and smooth and ready to go. I also repainted, where is he gone? Here he is, the radiator fairing at the same time. So now I need to apply a chipping solution and there are various ways of doing this. So I used to have an ammo of MIG uh, heavy chipping fluid, which was really brilliant, worked really well. Um, it all got used up. I now have this Scratches Effects chipping fluid. It's pretty much the same, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, and this is your sort of um, water-based stuff. And the problem with this stuff, when you spray it on, if you've ever seen anybody do it, it's like water on a freshly waxed automobile. It just pulls up and just it, ugh. it's really hard to get a nice even coat coverage with it and that then leads to the problem of it being quite hard to get nice even chipping which probably sounds like a, a contradiction in terms but what you don't want is your chips to resemble a load of circles where the, where the chipping fluid is made into dots so what i tend to use most of the time actually is hairspray this is my hair matters Firm hold hairspray. I don't think the firmness or otherwise of the hold is relevant to us. <laughs> the only thing that matters is that this stuff melts in water. Um, I can't remember where I got this from, but it was probably Asda or somewhere like that. It's just the cheapest one. Um, and you can see I've got this contraption affixed to the nozzle. So how do you decant an aerosol into an airbrush? Because I do not want to aerosol my model with hairspray. For one thing, it's really hard to have the control for another my entire room will stink of hairspray and, I, and I, I, I haven't enjoyed that smell since I was 17 so let's not go there so what we do is we decant and the way we do that in a lot of cases with aerosols certainly the ones you tend to use in modeling you've got a little chunk on the nozzle when you have that little chunk the spout you see here can be trimmed now this spout is made from the tapered end of a pipette these are just the cheap modeling pipettes you can get from anywhere cut it off and that taper then gives you an infinite amount of sizes that you can trim to so you'll trim trim the tapered spout until it just snugly pops onto that little lump and then you can decant to your heart's content this being designed for use on hair it doesn't have a spout it's got the flush kind of air, uh, end in here so what I've done is I've cut a slight curve into the bottom of the spout here so that it sits against um, the plunger and I've just used some blue tack as you can see and that's just holding it in place it's not going to hold it in all weathers obviously but what we need to do it's adequate now you can see there's already some in the airbrush I'm just going to move the model because I don't want to uh, have an accident on that some already in there but all you need to do is I've extended my spout with a bendy straw. Good luck finding a plastic bendy straw these days in the UK, but if you do, guard it with your life. So, 
put your straw in there and simply psh, I don't know if you could really see how that went, but there you go. Absolutely no bother at all. It all goes straight in the airbrush. No spillage, no mess. And minimal stinky hair, hairspray smells. And then you, when you're done, just pop all of that off. Blue tack goes back in the blue, cap, blue tack stash and the spout goes in the spout pot. And there you go. And that's the sort of flush top that I'm on about. Just pop the lid back on there. Now you'll also notice, if you've never done this before, when you first do it, you might be initially alarmed by the fact that the fluid that ends up in your airbrush colour cup is frizzing, frizzing and bubbling like something insane. That's just the gas. The pressure in the can is, is from gas. That's that gas escaping from the liquid. And it is a good idea to let that fully escape before you start spraying because otherwise the aeratedness of it it will continue to be bubbly and aerated as it's going through the airbrush you'll get a kind of a spattery flow it's not ideal so there you go that's the way to decant it I'm now going to spray this hairspray direct from my airbrush into the areas where I think I might want to do a bit of chipping um, and it's mostly going to be focused on the leading edges of the inboard section of the wing obviously the high foot traffic areas on these inboard areas here and a few selected areas underneath where it's going to stay black remember there are no special considerations with airbrushing this just treat it as any any clear uh, paint medium and just spray it on so you've got a night you need to look at it in the light so you can see how it's going on um, just get a nice continuous smooth coat and then leave it and you need to let it dry and there it was black as you can see I have simply painted the whole thing black underneath and on top just a normal blinky brass guns in there so I did add the guns I forgot to mention that I've just glued them in with the ammo ultra glue um, I only left them on as long as I did because I wanted to get that leading edge perfect but now because of the the demarcation with the camo I decided to put them in before I started painting so they were primed with Mr Surfacer uh, in a probably vain attempt to get the paint to stick um, and then they've been painted in with the rest of it so yeah this is just XF85 solid easy no messing coat all over I will of course be titivating the underside some because that is staying black uh, as you can see I have also painted most if not all of the other bits and pieces that I mean there's going to be other bits that need to be black but most of what needs to be black is at this stage already black so <laughs> what we're doing here <laughs> we're, we're, we're black basing aren't we yeah so I've started to divide in the black and I thought I'd show you the results of that and how I've done it so I just flip him over I'm not entirely sure how well this will show on the video it is quite subtle uh, but this wing has been messed with and this wing is not so this wing is simply XF85 and this one has had some messing around so I'll come up closer and around the nose you can see my chipping so this has been done with my specific brush for chipping which is simply an old Liquitex basic round brush which has been cut right down way down so it's somewhat stiff I can't remember where I got these from I think it could have been um, Hobbycraft or somewhere like that they used to sell these in, in packs of three or four and they're actually really decent I keep talking about paintbrushes later and I suspect lately and I suspect that's going to continue to be honest it's my latest thing um, but I haven't seen them in a long time anyway this one was cut way down and it's quite stiff now so it's good for chipping so everybody kind of knows or understands potentially I suppose that the concept of chipping with hairspray and things is that you put on your underneath colour then you put on your hairspray and then you add water and rub the top paint off and what happens is as the water penetrates your paint layer it dissolves the hairspray underneath it which allows that paint layer to lift away 
in a hopefully fairly random manner and the other chipping fluids work in exactly the same way. What people don't talk about is that what paint you use for your colour layer and how long you leave it before you attempt to chip actually matter quite a lot. If you use something like Tamiya paint and I do find Tamiya is easier to chip than Mr Hobby and certainly easier to chip than Mr Colour. If you try and chip it straight away the paint will virtually wash off if you're not careful. You don't have to use much water or much force um, and you can end up with a lot more chipping than you really want. Conversely if you leave the paint a long time you end up with what I have here which is some fairly subtle chip chipping and it's actually quite difficult to do. You have to be quite patient and keep on come on focus camera you can do it there you go and keep on rubbing away until eventually you start to go through and you start to get chips and what you see here is the result of not just the brush but also a cocktail stick and in fact good old Trizac because another factor people to seem to miss about chipping is that paint rarely just flakes all the way off to bare metal it generally wears down a bit on the way to chipping right off so actually giving it a bit of a rub with some very fine abrasive will help to get, give that sort of almost transition between thinning paint and flaked off or chipped off paint um, which is what I've hope, well, I have achieved here and hopefully you can see that obviously I'm not bothered too much with the upper surface that's going to get over painted again the, the cocktail stick is useful for when it is tough to chip like this or if you're using lacquer paints and they're tough to chip this is a proper wooden cocktail stick as opposed to a bamboo one and I've sort of nibbled the end of it with my teeth to soften it a bit. Get this damp, get the paint damp and kind of scrub it gently with a cocktail stick to get the chips started and then go back to using your paintbrush and same applies with with your little bit of um, sand and sponge just try and get it going with that and then go back to scrubbing with the paintbrush. It's quite difficult to do, this paint's been left overnight and it took quite a while to do that. Um, moving on from there then, XF85, messed about with XF85. In natural light with your eyes, it's quite easy to see the differences in the sort of texture of this finish. I don't need to put decals on this understyle, so this is finished. I'll probably put a bit of sort of speckles and bits and pieces on it, but it basically this is how it's going to stay. And you can see that there's differing levels of sheen and slightly different colours and the way I've done that is with a mixture again Trizac although you need to be careful because of all the raised detail and actually oil brushes. The colours I have used are in no particular order Rust, Starship Blaze Sludge, Startship Filth, never forget the T, uh, and Black. I do like oil brushes but I'm going to show you and this is irritating to me because I've met Megan, he's a great guy and he's a fantastic modeler and I like a lot of his products but so often they're a bit disappointing in some ways and so these things are marketed as having a good consistency which they do they're just oil paints with a nice fine applicator brush to place the stuff exactly where you want that one isn't too bad although you see there's a lot of paint on it and it's quite difficult to rid the brush of that excess material without just putting it on some paper and wasting loads of it. Is the rust one any good? Not really. Uh, but, but this one is a doozy. This is a really good colour, a little bit lighter than the Starship Filth, but the brush I mean, <laughs> say no more. Absolutely dreadful. And then, obviously, today I've come to it and I went to take the lid off my Starship Base Sludge, which I only used the other day, uh, and the lid promptly just removed itself. It works now because I've freed it off, but these are obviously glued on and it left the, the lid behind and it was quite difficult to open. It's annoying. Because these are a good product, but as with most things, Meg, it seems that in reality the lifespan of them is quite limited. And the brush on this one's actually quite decent. 
what I end up doing a lot of time is just dabbing a bit with the supplied brush into a palette and then using a decent paintbrush to apply it. Anyway, I digress. So I've applied the different shades in different places and no, it's not really a dot filter or anything like that, but I've put the stuff where I want it and then I've spread it out with an old biggish brush. It's an old Vallejo brush. As you can see, it doesn't really have a point. It doesn't really need to have because what I'm doing is just blending and this is dry blending. I'm not using thinners. Put the stuff on and blend it with the brush until happy. I have also used enamel thinners. This isn't oldie worldy humbrol enamel in here unfortunately. It would probably be better if it was but this is just various different enamel thinners over the, over time that have ended up in there. And I put a little bit on the brush and just use it to to help blend things out and kind of stab the surface to make irregular patches and all sorts. And as I say with the naked eye you can see all kinds of patina in this difficult on the video that may come through better on the main footage we'll see but you get the point you can clearly see that there's a very big difference in how this looks to how this looks uh, um, but I haven't gone to the extremes of offering an almost sort of cartoon weathering effect just to show that I've done it I'm not into that I want it to look like you know realistic essentially and that's where I write that at with that I will continue obviously to do the rest but I thought I'd show you the methods involved. In other news I think I've decided to do a different aircraft now. Um, obviously I'm a female, I reserve the right to change my mind whenever I want. Um, but having done research into B581 it does seem that there really isn't any evidence to suggest that the aircraft ever wore the later scheme. Um, what there is, is evidence that number one squadron aircraft were repainted straight into day fighter scheme, which is all, almost equally interesting. If you look some pictures up, um, JXY or BE500, you can see that there are lots of pictures around with some really curious uh, paint application and weathering. But I want the black underside, so I'm actually going to go with this one. Uh, this is a picture straight off of um, Armarby's website, as you can see. Hopefully they're okay with me using it in this way. Uh, but I've got a couple of pictures of this aircraft. Pictures of, a, of it as it was. With the applied camo. And that of it with some squadron mates. This is an 87 squadron aircraft and this is for operations over Dieppe that they added this sort of day five day fighter upper surface camo and you can clearly see on this one the really worn leading edges and the quite random approach taken to the both the camouflage pattern and the application of the colour. Plus on top of that the colour is mooted to be mixed grey um, rather than either medium sea grey or ocean grey. It's reputed to be a mixed grey with dark green and various bits of markers. So here are the results of all that messing about with oils uh, and chipping and yes there's not much chipping considering I painted the whole damn thing silver, I know that, um, but I, it, and it's just a personal thing, I think chipping looks a lot better if it's done as chipping, i.e. rubbing through a layer of paint to an to a aluminium coloured uh, layer underneath than it does if you paint chips on the top of the paint. That's just my personal preference, that's why I do it this way. Um, but this is how it looks. I, I feel it looks quite natural and in scale, which the other type of chipping rarely does on aircraft models anyway. You can also, I hope, quite clearly see all the differences in the tone, the weathering, the sort of mucky effects and if you're struggling at all if you feel like it doesn't look actually like there's very much going on at all if I just plug in these fuel tanks which have not been messed with I think you can immediately see the difference so the colours I've used as I've already mentioned and I have done the, the, the undercarriage by doors as well the undercarriage leg fairings, whatever you want to call them. 
These have been treated to a slightly more earthy approach to represent uh, sort of muck and mess that gets thrown up with landing on grass fields, as these aircraft basically did. But the colours, as I already said, the only addition is the streaking br brushes. So we've got black, starship base sludge, starship filth, rust, and this is warm, dirty grey streaking brusher which is effectively these are like they're a halfway house between an oil brusher and the actual pre-mixed washes that you get so these are a bit thinner and actually for working on a matte finish like this they are slightly easier it is easier to do oil oil blending on a, on a satin finished surface uh, in fact the satin finished surface is the best um, it kind of tends to grab quite hard on a matte finish like this uh, and you can end up a lot of times wishing you hadn't really started it with, with the right old mess but the beauty of using oils is if you really don't like it you can get um, a rag a tissue with some enamel thinners white spirit or even turpentine and, and wash it all off you know and start again um, that's also the problem with this finish because I don't want to use a a clear coat on this I like it I like the patina I like the varying levels of sheen and, and the colors and the wear and I will add a little bit more with spraying uh, uh, later on as we go but the issue with that is that if I handle this too much if I'm not careful where I hold it and how I handle it I'll gradually wear it all off but of course the flip back side to that again is I can just put some more on it's not the end of the world so that's the black done for now I am going to do a touch up piece just here that's why this piece is curiously unweathered I'm going to spray that area uh, with neat LP5 to represent an area that's been touched up with smooth night on top of this very very susceptible wear uh, special night finish and I'll also touch up the cannon barrels which are already chipping off because there is no known paint that sticks to brass apparently but you can see there the you get these tips, I've barely touched it, so I'll, I'll spray those in with some LP5 as well. Well, now that I've decided to change the aircraft I'm finishing, this as, I've had to do a couple of minor modifications. So I've finished the underside, did that touch up there, um, and then switching attention to the top sides, uh, I did a load of looking around, and the aircraft I really wanted to do was actually this one uh, which I think is HL865 potentially LKR uh, the main reason I sort of thought maybe I'll do that one is first it's got this interesting fairly shabby overpainting uh, and secondly it didn't have the exhaust glare shields because obviously I haven't fitted them to my model because the one I originally wanted to do didn't have them but upon closer inspection of this actually very good photograph, if I bring that up close, note the vents, which I dutifully removed from this one in line with the instructions for the aircraft I was previously modelling. Uh, but what this one does show is that the aircraft did still have the tanks fitted after the overpaint. Uh, so if we're talking in terms of the Dieppe raid, I think they carried bombs so the tanks were gone and certainly in some of the other photographs one moment please like this one for instance the tanks are not present going by the documentation and, and what everybody says when you look online it's supposed to be medium sea grey and dark green it's clearly field applied with a paintbrush or a roller but I suspect it would have been a paintbrush or paintbrushes um, and it's also clearly quite patchy in its coloration it was, it was applied over the black paint uh, as well as you can see by the paint wear on the leading edge um, and the theory that abounds is that it isn't medium sea grey it's actually some form of mixed grey so therefore a grey that no one knows exactly what it is. The dark green is going to be dark green. The second question is what colour are the coats? Now again a lot of the profiles and what have you online show these as medium sea grey 
But my concern with that would be that if they had medium C grey for the codes, why did they not have medium C grey for the camo? And then again, on top of that, you wouldn't be able to see them clearly over the grey like that if the grey behind them were the same and so on and so on and so on. So again, popular opinion and all the rest of it suggests that they're actually Sky because Sky was available. None of it seems to line up. I'm looking back at the extra decal and I know extra decal uh, are not the font of all knowledge but on the black version of BE500 you've clearly got medium C grey serials but then on the overpainted aircraft from the same squadron, these other ones, they're Sky. Uh, the other problem with doing LKR or LK question mark, both of which I have photos of, is that they have got their night scrolls still on them. So it seems like most or all the aircraft on the squadron had this little scroll under the canopy with a, a night name. It doesn't say what the night name is on this one, but you can see it in red there. Uh, these two are Nightingale and Night Duty. But again, uh, it's clearly obvious in the overpaint photo that they painted over it on this one, whereas on the other two mentioned they did not. So that's where I ended up with then. BE500 LKA flown by Squadron Leader Smallwood. Uh, the other nice thing I found out in doing this research and um, it is one of the more interesting parts of making a model, a lot of the time actually, is, is doing research, is that 87 Squadron for a time operated from RAF Bybury. That is B-I-B-U-R-Y, uh, which is just literally down the road. And in fact, I was there only a few weeks ago on my motorbike with some friends. They had a bike night there because Bybury is now inhabited by a classic car restoration and sales company uh, using some of the remaining hangar buildings that are st still there. Um, so it's a nice local collection, nice local connection actually uh, for me to do one of 87 Squadron's aircraft because it may well have operated from the airfield just down the road. So with all that said then, next up we need to think about masking. So this was done with paint brushes uh, and as much as those demarcations are not anything like neat, <laughs> they're too neat to be represented by any sort of freehand painting um, because they were done with a brush. So I need to do some masking and I've decided that uh, I'm going to use this stuff to do that. Masking putty or panzer putty it's known in some circles and I think the Americans refer to it as silly putty. I'm not convinced that we Brits have a similar um, child's toy as this, but it's very strange stuff. I quite like it. It's got a strange bounciness to it, but if you pull it apart quickly, it shatters and breaks. If you pull it apart slowly, it stretches absolutely forever. And no matter what you do with it, when you put it back in the tin, within a fairly small amount of time it settles back down into a smooth surface. It's really queer stuff. A little bit non-Newtonian like custard isn't it? But I'm going to use this so you could make it into worms like you would with blue tack but I'm not going to. It's actually easier with this stuff because it it will sort of deform over time and flow. You may make it into sheets like this make it into pieces like that and then use those pieces to create the edge that you want because you can fold and bend it around all over the place as you go and even once it's in place you can poke it about with cocktail sticks to change the line change where it sits and you can create an entire mask like that in a matter of seconds as if you just see. Now I've just podged that on. I'll do it properly to better match the photos uh, at my leisure. But you can fit that anywhere and around any anything. It will conform so, so well, much more easily than tape. It'll just stretch and bend into place. And because I want a fairly sharp edge, I want it quite thin like this is as well. 
and I'm aware that this black model with the black putty is probably not the easiest to see what I'm trying to say but I will create a sort of a a bit of a mask coming along the bottom of the fuselage uh, and around the nose area I will not bother around the front ed leading edge of the wing because it's all going to get chipped so there won't be much of that demarcation left anyway As for colour then, having um, decided that this is some kind of mixed grey and not just straight medium sea grey, I've settled on this colour, XF66, it's just called light grey. Uh, as a comparison to medium sea grey, it looks like this. There's not a massive difference, but it also isn't the same as ocean grey. Um, so it will be obviously incorrect when it's looked at, which is what I want. Uh, and I will use probably oils again mix some colors to try and sort of replicate that streaking to an extent but i will also be spraying it very small so that some of that localized patchiness can be brought out sort of within the painting process and i will actually show you as i go along what i'm on about with that as i'm partially through this sort of initial laying down of camouflage color i thought i'd show you how I'm going about it. As I've already said I'm using XF66 because I don't want it to look right. I'm a bit annoyed that it looks more correct than it should <laughs> but hey ho. That is thinned with a Mr Colour Thinner standard Mr Colour Thinner which is this stuff. The 400 only relates to the size of the bottle so don't be taken in by that. I have it decanted into this little dropper bottle for ease. Um, of course you can use rapid or mr leveling if you wish uh, i have also added some tamiya paint retarder this is sold for their lacquer paint which ironically really don't need it um, but it does work really well in the acrylics as well and the reason i've added that is because of the way i'm painting this so tamiya isn't really normally terrible for clogging the airbrush needle but when you're spraying it the way I'm spraying this, it, it kind of does. And it's <laughs> it's mom it, it's really annoying. So I'm using my prized Awata Custom Micron Plus. It's a CMC Plus. Not sure what the plus signifies, but it's a 0.18mm needle setup, so it's pretty fine. And after a few minutes of spraying, what happens is, because it's spraying such a small amount, don't think it's not too bad at the minute but when we talk about clogging of the tip we're talking about the paint build up on the end of that needle and I hope you can see that that is it's kind of grey you can see the grey paint on it so what you need to do every every few minutes really is be cleaning that build up off the needle so you, you never really get into a flow and if you do find yourself getting into a flow go with it realize that you're in a flow and keep going because um, it will save you quite a lot of time. It's one of them. If you if you can keep the paint flowing and keep going, it, it, it makes it easier. And the way I clean it, I have a cotton bud with a touch of Mr. Colour on it, and I just just roll it across, or you just pinch it off with your fingers. You will also find you'll get a bit of paint build up on the end of the air cap like that, and occasionally it's as well to clean that off because what it can do over time is is start to get across the little air hole in the end there and when it does that it does start to cause issues there we go so why am i using such a fine airbrush and such a fine setup well the reason is because i'm trying to paint the thing in scale i'm trying to paint small and what i mean by that is i'm painting it's almost like i'm coloring this model in with a with a felt tip and while i'm doing it i'm thinking about the process as it would have been carried out by the guys that did it back then so picture the scene you're your ground crew on the hurricane squadron and you've been told you've got to put camo on your black aeroplane so they probably got a diagram they probably got given a picture uh, to show what the pattern's supposed to be they may even have looked at it but do you think they were constantly referring to it as they went along I seriously doubt it yeah. If you look at a uh, contemporary, this is the extra colour, extra decal instructions. That's just the standard 
they fight to camo pattern reproduce there so you can see no matter how you look at it you can see this is really quite different to that it's simplified so I'm pretty much making it up as I go along here's this side so far and I, I, I'm sort of referring to the photos backwards and forwards and I'm looking uh, I've sort of got that general knowledge of the overall pattern it seems reversed to me as well but I'm just drawing it in and filling it in as I go so to show you how I'm actually painting it I'll just do a bit of footage of what I'm doing just for a moment so you can see how this is going on So you could see this is going to take a while and the reason I'm doing it so small is just to try and replicate the idea of brush strokes. I'll come back in with some oils or maybe some brush painted paint later to really mimic some of the more obvious brush strokes around markings and things like that. Um, but the reason I'm going along the panels like that is if you think about it whenever you paint anything in your house, you paint, paint, paint a room, you tend to paint along edges of things if not first you definitely do paint along edges of things so my feeling is that the brush strokes are going to follow panel edges where they are there um, and likewise with the direction I think it would be natural for a lot of people to paint areas like this vertically and areas like this fore and aft um, so that's that's the thinking behind it and as you can see so far it kind of just looks like a really badly applied coat of paint that's not quite finished and it's overly pre-shaded or indeed black based uh, but hopefully as we go through that that appearance will diminish and you can also see that I've already chipped that grey paint in these places I did that while it was still fairly fresh so it was easier to get it to chip in a bigger way and I shall do the same with this wing root once I've got it coloured in Sometime later then, this is what I've ended up with. I've, I've got all of the camo on. Now, as you recall, we used the XF66 as it comes for this mixed grey colour. It may appear in this footage that it looks a little bit like ocean grey, and, and it does. But just for reference, ocean grey is quite a lot darker. The reason it looks as dark as it does is obviously because of the black basing. There's more work to be done yet and I will probably lighten the colour somewhat whilst I'm doing that. The green is good old XF81, uh, Tamiya, which is dark green, two brackets RAF, and it is, I think, a really excellent match for the dark green. And again, it looks a bit darker than it should because of this black undercoat and because of the fact that it's thinly applied so that I can try to give the impression of brush strokes. A little bit of a close up for you. This is what it looks like so far. You can see I've rubbed the paint off there, and we've got chipping through to the black and the previously chipped bare skin. I just wanted to point out, really, at this stage, that with something like this, it is sometimes necessary to test and adjust as you go along. And one such uh, point in that in in this particular scheme, I'm just going to show you. Of this photograph 
it's a little bit difficult to see because of the way the light's falling on top of that after fuselage but the grey dips down over the top of this of the A of the codes stop reflecting light there we go the grey it comes up and then it dips back down again over the top of the A or appears to to my eyes anyway um, and I have replicated that somewhat on the model here but obviously on the model so far I don't know exactly where the codes are going to fall and I'm not going to fit the codes so that they fit the camo I'll fit the codes where they should be and what I'll do afterwards if necessary is actually adjust the camo pattern to suit the markings as I put them on you can see it here as well again it's a little subtle because of the lighting but you can definitely see where the green goes around the top of that A and the grey so it makes like an outline around the A and this is what I need to now put the markings on so that I can actually bring this roughly applied camo around the markings as you saw it in all the photographs and potentially adjust the shapes of some of the patterns a little bit but as you can see this isn't a standard RAF camouflage pattern at all I mean it sort of is in some respects and some some of the shapes and and dimen uh, dimensions some of the shapes and and the sort of general ratios of colour aren't too far off but it it's much simplified and the camo is going the wrong way on this wing it should essentially be going that way so yeah markings are next and for that I'm not going to use the kit decal sheet here it is obviously I don't have the right codes on there anyway um, but I'm going to make my own mask so all I need for this build are roundels fin flushes and codes uh, the serial number has been overpainted, as we've seen. I don't need to worry about stencils because I really don't think they'd have got put back on either. Um, so this is all stuff that's within the remit of making your own handmade custom masks, and that's what I'm going to do. I don't have a silhouette or a Cricut cutter. I don't have the necessary knowledge to operate one either. So I'm going to do it. Um, with a straight edge and a scalpel blade and I will show you how So to make your own mask you're going to need some sort of masking material uh, And these are the ones I have so this is our tool ultra mask I did get this a really long time ago um, but this is the Sort of clear ish vinyl I'll get this edge up it's relatively thick it is quite um, quite easy to make it to conform to most surfaces but what it won't do is double curvature at all and it's also not going to sit down very well around the sort of sharp tight detail that this model kit has on it those raised rivets on the wings are going to be a major problem for this material it's really good as you can see I've made multiple masks in the past and for some reason kept them um, it's really good on smooth flats flattish or sort of unidirectional curves and it's quite easy to work with because it's clear but this time it's not going to be what we use the other things I have are these I've got some ammo masking sheets so in here are five sheets of sort of kabuki tape and it's a full uninterrupted A4 sized sheet so there's five sheets in there I can't remember what this cost but it's several pounds and then in the other side of this I have stored a Tamiya masking sheet set this one masking sticker sheet one mil grid type five pieces for those of you who might want to look it up there's your details there and this is um an A5 so it's half as much tape here but it's all printed with this grid so this kind of thing is is going to be much more useful for doing things like codes because you can utilize the grid on here to help you draw them up and that's what we're going to use for this project we'll use these sheets to create the masks we need it's also fair to say that you can buy commercially sets of pre-made masks from the likes of these 
This is a Makoto set, Makoto, Makoto. These are unfortunate US stars and bars, so they're no good to me on this occasion. But there are sets out there that you could buy, sort of roundels and fin flashes, etc. would be covered in multiple types and sizes. Um, I'll see if I can find some and link them, maybe. But if you check out somewhere like Hannah's, you'll probably find something like that if you don't fancy making them yourself. So as well as some suitable, suitably sized tape, because when you're doing smaller markings, obviously you can get away with this, the sort of normal tape, snail tape, the 18mm especially, this one, you can quite often get masks out of this quite successfully as well. On top of that we shall need something to cut circles and for that we'll use a compass cutter. I have two. Uh, this is the cheap one. Uh, the, these are available absolutely pretty much any sort of hobby store is going to have these. I can't remember the brand um, but this will cost you no more than a few quid. This one is an Alpha. So the same brand as my Scriber. Same deal, it's a compass cutter. Still made of plastic. But this one is a little bit better quality, I think. But it is still just a plastic, essentially just a compass, but it's got a blade in it instead of a pencil. This one comes with spare blades and a little blade, uh, pin and blade protector, which is nice. Straight edge, obviously. And also a set of dividers can be really useful. Uh, if only for check, you know, for checking that you've got consistent sizes on things, and for actually for alignment sometimes as well. So how do you go about doing it then? It's really quite simple. Um, I mean, I'm sure it could be complicated if you wanted it to be, but we'll start with the roundels because they're the easiest, and I'm going to assume that the kit kit wing roundels are the right size, and uh, and I mean. You could go about this a few ways. You could find the centre of the circle in the normal finding the centre of a circle way. You can make a rough measurement using your steel rule. But to be honest, what I generally do is just eyeball it. So I'll hold the tool up to the roundel. I can't do it so that you can see it and I can see it at the same time. But I'll look at it and sort of try and find the centre myself and set these to roughly whatever I think they might need to be that looks pretty reasonable to me and then to test the theory I'll get a piece of normal tape stick it to the bench and just make a circle like so when you're cutting anything with this type of tape the tape's got a slightly um, a tight texture to it and you can feel and hear the blade cutting through that texture so the way to know that you have completely cut through the tape all the way is that you won't hear any of the little sounds it makes as it cuts the little threads so I've cut a circle based on my guesstimate and I'll offer that up to the decal and see if it's the right size just by sticking it on there and um, well I won't put smug mode on but that's actually spot on uh, so now I know what size the middle circle needs to be so at this point I'll cut two circles out of my big sheet in exactly the same way and I'm going to leave myself plenty of space you can actually hear that sort of it's almost like slight fibres it's cutting through and again leaving plenty of space cut the other centre out I'm not using a lot of pressure don't need to I think I've cut through the whole sheet there alright I'll move that slightly out of the way now because my centrepiece was exactly the right size, what I can do now that I've stuck that onto the decal is I can put the pin back into that central hole. So I'll just loosen the adjustment. I can put the pin back into the middle hole there 
and just now move the blade until it touches the edge of the blue which there we are yep that's my outside diameter I'll go back to my two circles which you probably can't see on the film and I'll cut the outside there we go that is two simple roundel masks cut do remember when you're using these to cover over the hole in the middle so you don't end up with a spot of colour in the middle that you don't want now the fuselage roundels and indeed if we were doing this type are slightly more complex because they have more circles but it's exactly the same technique you just have to do it four times instead of two times so here are the two masks I've just made in situ on the model uh, the one big advantage with that R tool ultra mask material is the fact that you can slightly see through it which aids immensely in the placement of these things there are lots and lots of different ways to do it um, in some respects it could be easier to place the circle so you can see where the circle is going then put the outer outside on it to, for alignment and then take the circle back out again I've just put the circle straight on but what I have done is used the calipers and taken a known, a known point here so the distance between this panel line and the edge of the round or there and then gone across this side and checked that they're the same or at least close they don't have to be identical remember because whoever was painting these originally they wouldn't necessarily have been exactly in you know, identically the same place to the millimeter so as long as they're ballpark the same uh, you just take various different known distances and cross check and make sure that they're ballpark and just eyeball the thing and make sure it looks okay so thinking about colors then we need round or red round or blue and there are some paint manufacturers that carry those colours in their lines. I've just made my own. Uh, for round or red, I've got a dull red mixture, which is XF7, which has uh, red brown in it, just to bring it down to a sort of a much duller, more terracotta ish sort of colour. And my blue is Mr. Hobby H55 Midnight Blue with black in it which again just oh this is just a horribly sticky lid a bit difficult to tell from this but the black just desaturates that blue a little bit darkens it up a touch and makes it better for what we're going to do but in both cases believe it or not even the dark blue the opacity of those paints is not great so what we have here is a dark and a light substrate and that's going to show potentially through our roundel colours if we don't do something first so what we need to do first is put a ground coat in there so the obvious answer is to use white and you can use white and I very very often do I'm not going to on this occasion because I want the colours to be more dull than that so I think I'm going to use something like a XF83, just a very pale grey and I'm just going to mist that into this circle and you need to be very very careful about how you do this because if you spray your light colour whatever it is whether it's white or, or a pale grey or a beige or a pink or whatever if you spray it hard into this outside edge what's going to happen when you remove the mask is you're going to have a very 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 slight but visible white edge to your marking because the white's going in there first okay so the thickness of that tape yep it's all good you'll put your blue on and it'll look great but when you lift the mask off there'll just be that faintest little bit of a white edge you don't want that so we need to put it in very softly and very very thin around the edge because 
at the end of the day the blue is going to cover much more easily than the red we definitely need to lose that strong color difference in the middle there though i've got that xf83 in the brush back to the trusty revolution i've got the pressures turned fairly well down and what i'm going to do is just gently and carefully get rid of this harsh color transition Just like that. So you saw how I started in the middle and I worked my way out and really just concentrated on where that colour change was and now you can see that you can't see a colour change. We've got a nice flat, yeah there's a bit around the edge that's a bit shaded but that doesn't matter at all. In fact it will make the marking look better. Quick colour change, I've now got my red in there and I'm literally just going to spray the middle of my circle. I'm not going to go anywhere near the edge. I'm just going to put enough in the middle so that I know I've got enough there when I put my mask on. Now obviously we can play at pre-shading and mucking about with this if we want. Getting some... Uh, get off there tape. Getting some tonal, I'm, I'm switching directions so that I get it both sides of this panel line. Like so. Slowly, slowly building it up. I'm not spraying I'm not spraying smoothly or ever really in any sort of organized way and that's perfectly deliberate because I don't want it to quite look like a freshly applied marking. Just keep going until you're happy that you have the coverage you want and I'm just going to where's my tweezers gone? Yep, got plenty there, that's big enough. There. Looks pretty bright on the camera, doesn't it? It isn't at all. Let me see, can you see? Can I see? No one can see. So the next step is we have to cover up this red so that we can put the blue on. And the best way to do that is by using the big ring. Now if anybody's wondering why this one's got these O's on it, they don't mean anything, it's just telling me that this is from this mask. They should be pretty much identical, but in reality, when you cut things out, everything's always very slightly different from, from each other, so I just mark them so I know which is which. So I've just popped that back into place in there, if I get the centre out of the 
backing and then I'll pop that into the middle like so and then we just take that one back out press that down a bit more strongly and as I said earlier we need to cover up the hole where the where the cutter went through the material otherwise we'll have a blue spot in the middle of our handle which we do not want just a little shred of tape for that You'll find sometimes that they don't quite want to fit back together because they get a little bit stretched and distorted sometimes when you're fitting them. Don't worry too much again, it doesn't have to be ultimate perfection because as long as it's within a reasonable amount the eye won't pick up on it. That's that. So that's both of those back in. And I have blue in the brush, give it a little test, and we're going to spray the blue on. Because of this rivet detail, the mask doesn't sit super tight on the surface, which is why I'm spraying from such an awkward angle, I'm trying to spray down on it so that I don't encourage paint to go under the edge of the mask. But honestly, with spraying it as gently as I am, it's unlikely anyway. I like to vary the angle that I'm looking at it from because with the light when you move the model around sometimes you can see areas that need a bit more colour if you just look at it and paint from one angle you, you can miss those go that's one done I'm hoping you can see just how transparent this blue color actually is days three blue circles so shall we go for the big reveal then this one you can see I massively over egged the mask in there I don't have a lot of overspray at all but better to be safe than sorry as I've not cleared this finish at all so any overspray would just ruin everything
there we have it and you can see we've got a different finish there that blue is considerably shinier than the surrounding surface but don't worry that can be sorted out in a multitude of different ways you can use a tiny touch of uh, flat coat or similar just in that one area um, you can actually use a wash or a filter we'll dull it down quite substantially as well there's various ways to deal with it that don't involve spraying the whole model anyway so not to worry and actually one of the best things about spraying markers on rather than using decals is the fact that on a real a real paint finish the markings often do look slightly different have a slightly different sheen to them or a slightly different finish so it's really no bad thing there we go last little bit did we win yes we did and there's the other one now obviously um the you could argue that it would be more efficient faster however you want to put it to mask all the markings at once and only put the colors through the airbrush once and and that's that's probably true to be fair but it does make for a lot of masking and unwieldiness with the model when you're trying to do them all at once which is why i haven't bothered i'll just i'll go around and do them sort of one two at a time until they're all done and I'll come back when I'm ready to cut the codes and show you how I go about doing that. All right, now I've got the fuselage roundels on and the fin flashes. So the fin flashes are a simple matter of strips of tape cut to size. And I use the dividers just to make sure I get that middle stripe in the right place because the order of painting here was I used the pale gray as before when necessary to take account of camouflage demarcations. Then I, went in with the white so I did the central area and I lightly went around the edge remember what I said about how you'll see a, a ghostly edge of white if you put too much in there it has to be a very very thin layer obviously did the white up the middle of the fin flush at the same time <clears throat> then I replaced the outer ring of the mask over the area that needed to remain yellow and of course the circle that needed to remain white and again I used the other portions of the roundel to help me align these the red dot in the center put the centerpiece back in and at that point what I also did was use a bit a little touch of masking fluid all the way around the various sections of mask where they touched each other just to be absolutely sure that no blue spray would creep in between those gaps it is possible it can happen especially if you spray wetly that's not really a word but you get my drift so yes finally in with the blue and then demasked a lot what I did neglect to remember to mention in my round or cutting demo was the the compass cutter style of circle cutting tool will only go so small and it will not absolutely not go small enough to do the center of this rounder which is a sort of six millimeters or so um, there are various options when that happens um, the very laborious manual option is to use something like this this is a it's actually a Hasegawa scribing template which has circles which go up from half a millimeter all the way up to nine and a half in half millimeter increments you can place that down over your paper and cut using it it's difficult it's tricky i'm not going to lie it's it's awkward to do but it is doable uh, the other method is something like this this is my dsp iae craft tool stepless adjustment circular cutter it's a magnificently over the top tool for cutting tiny circles in tape there you go this is what it looks like it's incredibly expensive as well big machine block of aluminium bolted together with an enormous bearing in it and a piece that goes around and around in the middle um, it's currently disassembled so the knife blade goes in here and you get a little handle that goes through there but you have to disassemble it every time to get it back in the box so there is that these are quite expensive I'll pop a link in the uh, description 
to some to these and to similar things like this that you can find on Amazon. Um, but they will cut down much smaller, down to about 2mm or so, and if you need anything any smaller than that, then by far the simplest way to get a circular mask is to use a punch and die set. Alright, so that's the circles covered, then we moved on to the codes, and I completely forgot that I was supposed to film this to show how I did it, but in all honesty, it's just done by eye. I've used measurements, looking at the kit, looking at the kit decal sheet, and looking at photos of the original. I've made a, a fairly well-educated guess on the vertical size. I've then looked at, again at the kit decals and photographs and looked at the ratio between sort of the width and the height of the letters and I've essentially mapped it out based on that. So these letters are, for those that need to know these things, they're 10mm high and 5mm wide basically. Uh, I've decided on two boxes of thickness which is 2mm um, that's not 10mm high and 5mm wide, I'm talking nonsense, 20 My bad, they're 15mm high and 10mm across. So sort of a 3 to 2 ratio. They're 2mm wide, which I think, I just let's just finish that, okay. Which I think is possibly very slightly on the on the thick side for these particular cereals, but it coincided with two boxes on the graph paper, so I'm prepared to uh, call that good enough. And this, as mentioned, was done on the Tamiya masking sticker sheet, and this is a one mil grid here, so it's it's quite nice stuff to use to map things out for this kind of job. And it's thin enough that it cuts fairly easily, and this this is the result. It's a bit fiddly, a bit faffy, but it's relatively easy with D letters at least because there's no rounded corners on any of them. So it's literally just a case of using a ruler, cutting everything out with the scalpel until you're happy. It might take a few goes to get it absolutely right. Um, don't be surprised if that's the case. Um, but make sure you're happy with the mask before you commit to paint because it, obviously it's going to be a huge pain in the bum to put them right if you don't like them once you've painted them on the model. Here we are then, we've got the codes on. Now once peeled off these masks, you could you could uh, reattach them to the back and keep them for, for reuse if you really wanted to. I haven't bothered, um, just the one time. But here they are painted and I elected to go for the medium C grey option. So there's various different opinions out there about what colour the codes ought to be on these aircraft. Um, the options being medium sea grey sky or dull red. Um, in theory dull red should be the one because they were black before the camo was put on but there are some very well known colour photographs of this aircraft when it was black and the codes are clearly not red. Uh, but then the spinner was yellow at the time as well, so I don't know if you can really rely on things like that. Um, I read a lot of quite well argued theorising about this air these aircraft um, and the reasoning was that the codes would be sky. Um, but I think there's no reason for the codes to have been sky when the aircraft were black. So I've gone with medium sea grey because you can clearly see the codes have been painted around on many of the aircraft, so there we are. They did paint over the serials, and on this aircraft they painted over the, the night artwork on, under the co cockpit as well. Uh, so that's that. So I'll be putting no more markings on, this is it. I don't know if I've got this the right way around or not on the other side. Um, a lot of RAF aircraft I've done before, the codes have been reversed. So it would say ALK on this side. But um, various decal artwork I've looked at has got it this way round. I don't know. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I've done it that way. Yeah. And it's going to stay that way now. Clear. I'm sure someone will let me know in the comments if I've made a boo-boo there. Uh, as well as just using medium sea grey, I noted from the black and white photographs I've been using as inspiration for this, did the A appeared a lot brighter than the L and the K. And it wasn't just notable in one photograph, it was notable in several. So I used XF83 
and I then brightened it up with XF2 to just highlight the A a bit and also some areas of the other codes just to yeah, just to make it look more interesting if I'm absolutely honest. I didn't do it on this side because I didn't have any references to show that I should. I think I've done all right with those masks. They look reasonably okay. I think maybe there are these let the lettering's a tiny bit on the thick side, perhaps. But it's it's not too bad. I think I think it'll be all right. So from here then, what I'm going to do, you may recall I mentioned the demarcation here and adjusting it for this A. I'm going to do that. I'm going to flatten this curve here a little bit and just bring that down slightly further down and then along just to line it up with the photographs a little bit better. And from there on, I'm going to use some slightly different colour mixes in the airbrush just to provide some of this colour variation that you can see in the photos. I'll just get the photo up now. So, see how the A looks quite a bit brighter in that picture. It does in others as well. But you can see here, you can see the green, the vertical line back there for the green. But you can also see that the grey's got some differentiation there and it appears to have some here as well. I know there's highlighting due to lighting, I get that, but I can also see that, that bit there looks different to this bit here. So I'm going to put some slightly lighter colours in those areas and maybe a couple of others just randomly based on intuition. <laughs> um, and I'm going to do it to the green as well because again you can see here and it's also obvious uh, on the wingtip area on some of the other pictures that the green looks a bit odd as well so I'm going to do some of that and then finally when I've done all that I'm going to have a go at paint brushing some streaks into various places around the fin flash you can clearly see the brush marks in these photos uh, and around the roundels and codes as well and I say I'm going to cross my fingers because these types of paints will dissolve themselves as you put subsequent layers on. So if I'm not careful with the paintbrush, I could make a horrible mess and probably have to start again. So if you could all cross your fingers for me as well, that would be nice. All right, I've done what I'm going to do with the brush strokes. So you can see my lighter areas there that I spoke about. There, that angle shows it well. Those were sprayed in, in the same way I sprayed all of the top coats. And then I, I just got a paintbrush. It's just this old. Well, I say old. This is only the second time it's been used, but the tip on it is decidedly average. Um, paintbrush used my paints, XF eighty one and XF sixty six. And I used a palette and I thinned them with water. And by doing that, I was able to add these brush stroke effects, which look horrible, but frankly, they're supposed to. It's so difficult as a modeler to accept an, a horrible finish on anything that trying to do it deliberately is, it, <laughs> it's, it's odd. I don't, there we go, maybe that's showing. This wingtip in particular on one of the photos looks really weird. It's nowhere near as weird on my model as it is in the photos. But I think it's possibly fairly easy to see that there's quite a lot of differences in colour, in texture of colour throughout the model. I've painted around the roundel so they're a little bit messy when you look closely and there's just brush marks here and there which mostly, in terms of what I can see on this video screen, mostly show up through gloss differences. But again, the gloss differences are cool as well. I'm quite happy to have this kind of, these changes in patina across the model. Some of this, some of these glossy areas will get dulled down by the, by discrete spot application of sort of satin and flat coats at some stage but I do think looking again at the photos of the real thing it's quite it's quite crusty so I do think I'll 
do a little bit of oil weathering on the wings and if I if I use an oil wash on the roundels I might be able to dull them down just by using that but a bit of flat coat is there in reserve so this is where the main model is at I'm not sure it looks wrong enough um, it's certainly quite untidy though in places obviously there's more I say obviously I've not done as much with the right hand side because I don't have photos to work from and I didn't want to get it to look over the top the left side though is heavily based on what I saw on that photograph even down to the way the the painting around the fin is all just rubbish so that's the model as it is so far and the next few steps really it, it's going back to all the pieces uh, and catching them up really I've, I've painted the spinner while I was doing the markings this is in the the round of red I might give that a very light spray of uh, a bit of a deeper red just so it doesn't look quite so flat and dull um, and then there's a little pot here which contains all the remaining pieces so these all need to be painted and caught up um, right now what I'm going to do is demask the canopy see how this is looking so these were the kit masks to get them off you just need to get your tweezers whatever I do I'm going to cover this up for viewing get your tweezers and just pick at the edge just bring it in sideways so it grabs the edge of the mask and then just lift it off don't try and dig the tweezers under it whatever you do because you're liable to scratch the transparency quite easily alright then let's have a quick look at some of this progress of these little finishing parts so clearly I have fitted the landing gear legs these were just painted silver as per I used bare metal foil on the oleo section the strut you could obviously use a chrome pen or simply some sort of chrome style paint if preferred now fitting these was simple but not super positive so there's a sort of a tapered square slot that the main leg plugs into but it's got quite a lot of movement in every direction it's not tight and you then brace it up with this brace here that goes into a nice slot that fits very positively and then this strut just butts onto the framework here it does have a peg on it but I found on one of mine that the hole the pegs meant to go into is a little bit occluded uh, and I couldn't get the peg to go in it so I snipped the peg off rather than break anything trying to force it in so basically the net result is until you glue all the joints it's really quite wobbly so you kind of need to balance everything in position with one hand somewhat like this and sort of just touch the joints with liquid cement you could use super glue if that's your preference of course uh, or even ammo style super pva anything really but once they're in then leave them to set let that all set up properly and they're now quite nice and sturdy as you'd expect the real thing is also nice and triangulated uh, I have identified what is rattling <laughs> when I none too subtly removed the masking from inside the cockpit I dislodged the reflector glass on the gun sight and it's that that's now rattling around inside the fuselage never to be seen again quite irritating I should make a new one out of a little piece of um, acetate and pop it in there at some point I fitted the cannons they obviously just slot in um, no issues there and also the exhaust so you may recall these exhausts are actually labelled as being for a Spitfire I'm quite certain that in real life the Spitfire, the Spitfire exhausts are different I know internally the Hurricane ones are somewhat different but for our purposes as modellers and especially at this scale these are perfectly adequate and I think they look the part so we are tramping on now, the tail wheel's on as well, that's held in with the ammo PVA. Now, note, I painted the tail wheel leg black. I have not painted the main undercarriage legs, all the doors black on the inside. Some of these aircraft did very much have black gear doors and legs and even wheel hubs. 
any of the wheels at this point. Uh, and that is seen the photographic evidence. In fact, I suspect this one did, but I just didn't want everything to be black under there, so I've left it all silver. Oh, look at this. I just randomly dropped that gun sight glass. <laughs> yeah, smug mode. Yeah, good. I've got that back. Okay. Uh, gear doors then. The outsides were weathered when the rest of the belly was, and I've actually just dirted up the insides a bit, as you might be able to see from there. Aerial post is painted black. That was left black. The pito is black. The mirror... I don't want to twit ping this away into oblivion the mirror the rearview mirror i painted it first with the ak chrome pen this thing it's really good actually it's much better than the molotel one and then i stuck it face down on a piece of upside down tape so that also at the same time masked that face and then just sprayed it black over the top of the chrome pen and that's given a really quite nice mirror look except for that triangle it's made it look like a diver's mask but that's obviously the the mounting because it's clear plastic you can sort of see it um, and the nav light remember I said it got holes in it I just popped a little bit of the appropriate colour in each one and here's what it looks like fitted absolutely brilliant landing light lenses are on the lights themselves obviously had the AK pen treatment as well. And all of these transparencies are held in just with a little bit of gloss varnish. This is very thin, water-based, aqua gloss clear as you can see. I personally find it has minimal usefulness for painting models with, but it is quite handy for instrument panel dials and sticking transparent things in place that don't have a load on them. So you simply put it into position and just using a fine brush flood the joint area basically with this you can't see it once it's dry and it does hold it in relatively firmly and lastly for now as i'm already overheating because i turned my fan off to do this and it's very hot in the uk at the minute the propeller assembly so not quite finished yet but i'll show you anyway the spinner was painted with the same red that is in the markings but I felt that was a tad too dull, potentially. I didn't like it anyway. So I just enriched it slightly with some slightly brighter red that I'd mixed up for a different project. It's still dull enough to be left as is, um, but it's a little brighter to look at. But before I fitted it all together, what I did, I painted, I masked the blades, they were already black, I masked the blades to leave a th thin strip along the leading edge and I painted that strip with brass specifically this stuff this is guns mr. metal color these paints are absolutely terrific they're horribly expensive but they're very very good they spray beautifully but they also brush really nicely as well really handy tool yes sprayed that leading edge brass why because this is a Jablo propeller so they were made from wood a sort of type of pressed wooden blade and they had a brass leading edge sheath basically to protect them from erosion and they did chip quite badly so just remember if you want to chip your propeller on a hurricane you need a brass leading edge and you can only chip it along a thin width of the blade because that's the cover wasn't very big obviously I've masked and painted the tips yellow as well but if I try it's quite subtle, it's quite easy to see with the naked eye, but whether it's really going to show up on film, I don't know. I think it looks rather nice. Yet to come will be a little bit of sort of spotting and filth going on there. But that's where we're at at the moment, but we really are closing in very quickly on this being finished now. And I, I think really the next, or the final part of this video, it will be finished and it will just be the sort of reveal chat and the talk about the kit as a whole. Okay, we've got one final little wrinkle here. I had to make a new boarding step. As you know, I wanted to depict this in the raised configuration and I was just going to trim the kit part down, but I've actually managed to lose the kit part somewhere. So I just made a new one, just a little piece of plastic card. You can see where I just trimmed an edge off there. I just slipped myself a little 
sliver of plastic card off and just you know kept offering it up till it fitted rounded off the ends popped it in so that's that and I'll just have to paint it in um, with that done the underside is complete all of the relevant pieces are now attached and we do have a towel sitter so <laughs> it's all good uh, <laughs> I'll get this thing finished well here we are we're finished I have fitted the last of the parts. I've used the MO Ultra Glue mostly for these things. It's nice and easy to use, and if you splodge out excess glue, you can just wash it off. Um, so, just from where you saw it last, <coughs> I've added a few touches of matte coat here and there, and, and it is touches only. I've put some where the markings were shiny, as you can see, they are now a little bit more in keeping with the rest of the finish. I was tempted to leave them glossy because I do have a photo of this aircraft whilst it was black uh, where the blue section of the roundels is surprisingly shiny but I decided in the end that it looked a little incongruous and decided just to tone them down a little and the act of doing that has just blended the markings into the finish really really well. Um, obviously I've added the propeller, the aerial, the canopy, there's a tiny aerial at the front that you could probably barely see um yeah and that was it i've done a tiny bit more weathering there's some sort of speckly dirtiness around the wing roots i have added exhaust staining both sides obviously <laughs> idiotic thing to say you can see it a bit more on the on the right hand side because it's a paler color but it's on it's on both sides and underneath Again, a little bit of speckledge and dusting. Nothing much, it was all already done really. And if I just sort of try and move that around in the light, the weathering I did on the black is quite subtle. I'm hopeful it, it's going to come through on film. You can clearly see it with your eyes. There's just a patchiness and a dirtiness about it, but it's it's not specific and that's how I like weathering to be. I could have use different colours so that it stood out more I could have done the same on the top I could have done a panel line wash but I've done none of those things because I think I think it would be over egging the pudding to be honest um, with this spectacular surface detail it's quite evident where the panel lines are without adding a wash to further highlight them they're very very visible I, I didn't feel they needed any more than that I could have gone a bit more in depth with dirtying up panels and chipping fasteners and things like that but again I felt it would all it would do would be to detract from the overall look because your eye tends to get drawn to those little things rather than just to look at the thing as an overall. I'm really pleased with how this paint job has come out. It, it doesn't look as wrong as I imagined it should but in a way I think that's proof that I've got it right if that makes any sense. Um, it, it just looks right, it fits the aircraft, it doesn't quite look like the old matchbox box art, <laughs> but then, you know, it probably shouldn't quite look like that. Um, yeah, really, really happy with it, it looks, it looks just, it does look nice, um, and when you can see, I, again, I hope this is coming through on the video, but the patchiness and the sort of the different bits of colour and the brush marks and everything, they're all there. The stuff that I could see in the photo is all there. It's probably actually less obvious on the model than it was in the photographs. But again, I thought it's one of those where if you fully replicate what you see, it, it almost starts to not look like it's for real. So I sort of, I stopped where I was at and, and, de and decreed myself content with it. Um, yeah all in all it's been a thoroughly enjoyable project uh, and I've really loved every minute of it and I absolutely adore this finished model it looks great all right let's wheel out all the traditional phrases shall we let's draw a line under this one call it done all that good stuff the arm hobby 48 scale hurricane 2 what can I say it possibly hasn't already been said by others it it's a spectacular kit. I'd go as far as to call it a potential game changer, honestly, because it just offers 
something that no one else does really. Um, leaving aside the nature of the surface detail which is obviously a little bit outside the norm at the minute. Top tier manufacturers of World, two, World War II fighter aircraft. So let's say Hasegawa, Tamiya, Airfix, yes Airfix, and Edward are the ones that stand out. And this kit, this manufacturer, and they do it in 70 seconds as well, and I've already spoken about it on videos of 70 second things, manage to supply a level of detail that does not go with an attendant level of fiddliness. So, Edward, without a shadow of a doubt, are right at the top when it comes to the levels of detail that you'll get included in the kit you buy in the box but they are always quite fiddly and have a high parts count and a lot of small parts always Tamiya almost on the other end of that scale offer a high level of detail although they're arguably not quite as high but what they don't have is that attendant high parts count and fiddliness they're engineered in such a way that they fit together properly as long as you prepare things properly uh, and the detail is worked in with that. So your finished model for an Edward kit might be a little bit more detailed, have a little more finesse perhaps, but the Tamiya model is always going to be a massively easier build. Alma Hobby have just bridged the gap between those two and the last several kits I've seen from theirs, this is the second one I've built, but I I've looked at the last probably six or eight releases, all have that high detail slash low parts count thing going on. They all fit together beautifully and they're all moulded beautifully. Again, I think it's absolutely fair to say that nobody moulds things better than Tamiya. I think that is 100% a fair comment. I think Asagawa are close, but Tamiya just blow the opposition into the weeds otherwise other than Hasegawa when it comes to pure quality of molding they are the best but I'm a hobby and with this kit they're pushing it they're in, they're definitely in second place right now but back to this specific kit this offers something we haven't seen before it's got proper surface detail that represents what's really on the aircraft throughout the real aircraft does have raised rivets and here they are on the kit yeah, they're probably a bit oversized, a little bit overstated, um, but they add a certain something to the look of the finished model without a shadow of a doubt. The build itself was virtually flawless. Um, you'll have seen the build video, you'll have seen what I did to it. Yes, I titivated things along the way. I've thinned things and smoothed things and I've made sure things fit properly, but I would do that with any kit, including a Tamiya. But I think straight straight out of the box, this is hands down the best kit I've built in a long time. Hands down. It's absolutely fabulous. I think the only thing Armour could do better or could change to improve the pres presentation of this kit is perhaps to offer included photo etch as an option or include some of the 3D printer stuff that they do have in their range. The seat, the cannon barrels, the exhaust could all do with a little bit of improvement. Having the harnesses included in the kit would be a plus because it is an expensive kit. Whether it's worth the money that's being charged is always going to be a personal thing. But for me, it's similar to the way I think about eating out. Everyone likes to eat out now and again, don't they? Sometimes all you want is a McDonald's or a greasy bur burger from a van on the corner. But sometimes you want something nice and that's going to cost you some money. And I don't mind paying good money for a meal if I get a good meal. And it's the same with kits. I don't mind paying good money for a kit if I get a good kit. I do mind paying good money for something and not getting a good kit. Mentioning no names. That's not the case with this. You're paying for something and you're getting it. It's, it's brilliant. It is one of the nicest kits I've ever built. It's one of the best looking models I've ever made. I absolutely love it um, and I 
I hope I get the opportunity and the time actually to do some more of these in the different marks because the Hurricane 2 is just such a good looking aeroplane. So let's quickly do a compare then. I've got two other Hurricane models here. You've already met if you follow the channel and watch all the videos. You'll have seen this this one here. This is the Hasegawa Hurricane 2. I built this one a long time ago uh, as you can see by the very basic <coughs> finish that it's got on it. You can also see straight away how much difference that surface detail makes just at a glance how much simpler and almost bigger this one looks without all that extra detail to confuse the eye it's, it's surprising but what's also surprising potentially is actually just how well the Hasegawa kit does stand up um, this was built from the box there's no extras on this I, I, I'm lying there's a harness in there but other than that this was from the box the kit supplied cannon barrels on this are good the kit supplied exhausts on this are good and it is all round really a very well detailed kit by Hasegawa standards especially because they weren't always known for having a lot of detail the cockpit in this is nice I flip him over the wheel bays are nice as well there's no massive gotchas with the build it is a bit it's a bit there's a tricky bit back there. I can't remember it being a lot of trouble, honestly. Uh, but does it have any advantages over the armour kit? Absolutely not. Um, and truthfully, I don't think you'll find one for very much less money than you'll pay for this, if you can find one. The best hope, I think, with the Hasegawa kit is that someone like Hobby 2000 might re-release this soon with some different markings. So that's the Hasegawa, and this is, in, in my opinion, and that is all all of this is, it's an opinion, the only other Mark II Hurricane Kit 48 that is even worth considering. Uh, so if you can find one at a decent price, it is still a decent kit, it's worth looking at. One of the nicest features on it, actually, it's got a poly cap for the prop and spinner, and you can see here, it has that hollow front that I modified this armour kit to represent. The Hasegawa kit has it already see it's got some detail in there as well I don't know if it's prop governors or something that you could see and a poly cap so you can have a removable and spinnable propeller it is a nice kit uh, and it's still worthy despite its age and it stands up well in the looks department as well it looks it looks a bit beefier across this area here perhaps than this kit does slightly boxier in the fuselage shape I think the armor kit looks to my eye and it's only my eye looks more accurate I think this is maybe a, a, a maybe a tad porky okay the other competition technically it's not because this isn't even a mark II hurricane but this is the airfix kit the newer new, newer release not the olden days one uh, yes it's a mark one so technically it's not not competition but I thought it would be interesting to park them together and look at them and I think what it shows is just how good this airfix kit is it's easily a match for the Hasegawa kit the surface detail is actually better uh, and the shapes better as well but not being a mark II, it will never be a direct competitor to, the, to this kit obviously but I just wanted to show how they look together just so that you all can see just actually how good these two of the opposition are the other kits out there we've got a, a hobby boss hurricane i think they do both the one and the two i tend to just absolutely ignore hobby craft kits to be honest with you because so many of them are just laughable parodies of the real thing i'm unsure truthfully whether the hurricane is one of the, one of the ones that is good or not i don't know i haven't seen it with my eyes uh, the only other competition out there is the Italeri kit and that does have a fair few accuracy issues and it's really expensive for what it is. So there you go, I'll move these uh, I'll move these interlopers out of the shot and we'll go back to just this one. I have thoroughly enjoyed this kit. We are still missing the spade grip, the ADF is still in the book. Uh, for nil use control column it's been cannibalized to service BE515 
Uh, so unfortunately it's not really really finished but until the replacement comes through from the lovely Greg at Armour it's going to have to stay that way and I will just pop it in there when it does arrive uh, but yeah the build absolutely loved it I really enjoyed doing the research and figuring out ideas for this paint scheme I think it's come out pretty well um, yeah I thoroughly look forward to hopefully getting another one of these through I hope with all of that said that you've all enjoyed the two videos that come with this build I hope that it's helpful to those of you that are building it although I know a lot of people are already building it and it's too late for them and I'm sorry about that but I also think that a lot of other people are going to want to build more than one of these so it should be useful nonetheless. As per usual if you want to support me and my channel you can do so with buy me a coffee. Uh, if you don't want to use money to support me please drop me a like and a comment because that helps as well and with all of that said it only remains for me to say Look after yourselves, look after each other, and Genesis out.